So, okay, so thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much to the organizers. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in India, so that was a very nice experience for me. And I'm going to present some results we obtained with, together with Yuri Polyansky from MIT. Actually, part of these results were presented in uh, SIT in uh, 2016. So just to give you some notation, I will call X the input to the channel, Y the output, W is the channel itself. So those are the conditional probabilities of observing Y given X on the input. So something like this, just to make it very simple. And we will consider memoryless extension, so I will use bold uh, fonts for vectors and the extension of the channel and so forth. Where so memoryless just means that the probability of the output sequence is just the product of the probabilities of the single symbols being observed. So here again for the notation, I will use C for a, a, a code. A code is just a set of code words in this input alphabet uh, X, and a decoder is just a set of disjoint regions in the output alphabet. So whenever you receive something in this region, you decode for the first message. When you receive something here, you decode for the last one and so forth. Here I'm always assuming we will use maximum likelihood decoder because we want to study the performance of optimal code. So the decoder is essentially just a map from this to this and it is, uh, say, not uniquely specified, but you can build a likelihood decoder, maximum likelihood of the decoder given the channel W then we that we defined earlier. So the rate of the code is log m divided by n. Here I'm using binary logarithms and exponentials. And so we, we can define different probability of errors, probabilities of error. So when you send message m, you can define the probability of error given message m, which is just the probability that you fall outside the region for message m at the receiver. And then there are two probabilities that are usually used, the average probability of error and the maximum one. So the average is just the empirical, the arithmetic average of the probability of errors over the messages, and the maximum one is the maximum overall message. Actually, we will not, in the end, use the difference between the two because we will see that it is not important for our problem, but in, all, in other setting, settings, it can be very different. So the problem we want to study is the relation between the rate and the probability of error. This is probably the oldest topic in information theory. I'm sorry, I know this is not really something people are very much interested in recently, but it has been a problem very famous in the 60s, for example. And there are still some results coming out once in a while. So here, we want to study essentially what the optimal probability of error is for a given rate when you minimize overall code, so you take the optimal code, say, with a rate at least r and block length n. So small n will be the length of the block length, of the block, sorry. And here we want to study essentially how this average and maximum probability of error behave when you change the rate. So the most important uh, quantity, of course, is the channel capacity, which is defined as the, pr the supremum of all rates such that the probability of error here even the maximum one goes to zero asymptotically when you send n to infinity, so it takes very long block, very long uh, code. And there is another quantity which is relevant for this talk, which is the zero error capacity, which is the supremum of the rate for which the probability of error doesn't really go to zero asymptotically, but it is precisely equal to zero for some finite n. So you want to find codes for which the probability of error is precisely equal to zero, and establish what is the highest rate they can achieve with those codes. Of course, in some channels, this zero error capacity is simply zero. If you take a binary symmetry channel, there is no way of sending information with probability of error precisely equal to zero because any two code words can be confused. But the kind of channels that we will see are actually those for some of those for which this quantity is positive. Okay, so those two quantities are very different. Just to give you an example, if you take this channel here, and you consider, of course, you compute the capacity of this. This will depend on the three parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma. And when you change the parameters, you get very different values. But the zero error capacity of this channel here is just one whenever alpha, beta, and gamma are positive. So if essentially alpha is positive, so one can reach one. Let me try to use this. <laughs> so one can reach one and beta is positive, so two can also reach one. It means that there is some probability that when you send a one, the receiver will not know whether it is a one or a two at the input. 
but if you send one, the receiver will never confuse that one with the three, for example, because there is no common output between the inputs one and three. And so you figure out easily that the zero error capacity does not really depend on what values you put on those edges, on those transition probabilities, sorry. It just depends on whether they are positive or they are actually equal to zero. So the zero error capacity only depends on the so-called confusability graph of the channel, which is a graph which tells you which input symbols are confusable and which symbol symbol are, input symbols are not confusable. So for this channel, if you take alpha, beta, and gamma larger than zero, input one and input two are confusable. Input two and input three are confusable because there is a common output, but one and three are not confusable. So you just build a graph like this. So the zero error capacity of that channel would be uniquely specified by this graph here. So people usually say, or usually talk about graph capacity rather than zero error capacity, or say both terminologies are being used. And so for this channel, you can build a graph. For this graph, you can define as a graph capacity that you can define as the limit of the logarithm of the independent number of the graph, where you take the power of the graph here. Let me just go quickly. Instead of considering the single graph for one use of the channel, you build the graph for n uses of the channel, and you define the independence number of that graph, which is the highest cardinality of an independent set in that graph, and you define the, the capacity of the graph. This is not very important. This is just to say that when you see graph capacity, it is just zero error capacity of a channel. So just to give you an idea of three meaningful examples for the graph capacity, here you see a square, a pentagon, and an heptagon. They are meaningful for the following reason. The graph capacity of this one is two. Actually, it's one, sorry. <laughs> it's wrong. Uh, log two, it should be. Uh, so there's a typo here. So, yeah, because I, I used, sorry. Here there is a terminology difference in uh, information theory and uh, combinatoric usually. When you put a log here, it means that you want to measure rate. So since I used the log here, this would be log two. So this is one bit. So essentially here you can find two symbols that can never be confused. And it is very easy to prove that you cannot do better than this. We will see later on how to do that. For this graph here, the capacity was actually only proved by Lovelace in 79, although there was a lower bound by Shannon in, 60, in 56. So it took 20 years to prove that the lower bound was tight. And for this channel here, for this graph here, it is not known yet. So finding the graph capacity is uh, essentially one of the most famous unsolved problem in uh, information theory, probably. So just to see that, just to say that when you have uh, a positive zero error capacity, you should not be expecting to find the value of the zero error capacity for that channel. So finding bounds will already be something very good. Now in the range between, in between the zero error capacity and the graph capacity and the ordinary capacity, one can prove that the probability of error behaves exponentially in N, where N is the block length, keep in mind. So you can find positive functions of the rate, which are uh, say of interest in this range here, such that the probability of error is lower bounded than n up, upper bounded by an exponential function in n. And so it makes sense to define essentially what the speed of convergence to zero of this quantity is by, by defining the exponent, the error exponent or so-called reliability function, which is, which is the lim sup of minus one over n, the log of pe, which essentially means that you try to find what the actual exponent should be here. You take the lim sup as n goes to infinity because you want to find the best performance of possible code. Actually, the limit is not known to exist, so you should really define the lim sup, not the lim sup. But anyway, this is not really much of a problem. Here we are assuming that when the probability of error is equal to zero, this log is minus infinity, so the reliability function goes to plus infinity. <coughs> so this is just to give you some background. I'm sorry for those which already know very well everything here, but uh, it's important for those which are not into this topic. So just to give you an example, take, take a typical case with zero error capacity equal to zero. This could be, for example, the binary symmetry channel. This actually is the binary symmetry channel, but I don't want to stress that much. So there is a random coding lower bound on the reliability function. That would be the simplest of such BR that you can find. And this gives you, so a lower bound on the reliability function. Keep in mind, when you have an upper bound on the probability of error, you have a lower bound on the exponent. So a lower bound on the probability function is an upper bound on the probability of error. 
then you have this sphere packing upper bound, which tells you that the, the error exponent is in this region here. And as you see, they match exactly, usually in a positive, say in a range of rate, which is not actually null. Okay. So here you know exactly the reliability function, which means that essentially close to capacity, finding the reliability function is not a problem. It has been solved already in the 60s. The problem is when you go below this critical, what we call the critical rate, you go below this value. And here you have some additional lower bound. The most important one is the expurgated lower bound, which essentially tells you that when you go to very low rate, this random coding bound is not very good. This random coding is essentially a union bound over probability of errors. And when you go to very low rate, it turns out that the lower bound that you get using the union bound is not very good. So you can improve slightly and you get something better. And then there is this general result which says that when you even push the rate equal to zero, the sphere packing is very loose. Actually, the expurgated bound is tight at the rate equal to zero. And this is Berlecombe's result. He uses it in his PhD thesis. And then there is this other result by Shannon and, Ger and Gallagher that says that if you have a upper bound on the reliability function for low rate, you can connect that to the sphere packing bound. That is also the straight line that you get is also an upper bound on the reliability function. So in the end, you get this region here. Okay. So this is for a general channel with no zero error capacity. For the binary symmetry channel, which is the case that I'm plotting here, actually there are better bounds. So Barg and McGregor using the results by Lipstein and Kalai and Linian and so forth, they managed to squeeze down this to a smaller function and actually prove that part of this straight line here is tight, which is really an incredible result. Anyway, the problem is when the capacity, the zero capacity is positive. So there is a region here at low rate when you can send information with probability of error precisely equal to zero. So the error exponent should be infinite. So of course you will never find an upper bound on the error exponent, which is finite in this region. The sphere packing upper bound behaves like this. If you take the point where it goes to infinity, this gives you an upper bound on the zero error capacity because you have an upper bound on the error exponent. Then actually this quantity can be positive even if the zero error capacity is zero. So it's not always very meaningful. Then there is this random coding lower bound. You can build the expurgated bound and it will go to infinity at some point. And this expurgated bound, I will try to make this clear later, but I'm not sure how much time I will have. You can compute the expurgated bound in different ways. You can compute a single letter expression, essentially usually just the definition of the channel in a single use. But you can do something better. Take the multi-letter expression. Oh, first of all, sorry, here I just want, okay. Take the multi-letter expression of what happens when you use the channel twice. So define the extension of the channel over two uses. You do the same trick and you get something better in general than what you got before. And let me say here you're using the channel twice. So let me say k is equal to two. To two. And then when you send k to infinity, you can still use the bound and you get the best possible <coughs> expurgated bound, which is the multi-letter expression when you send the length of the block that you're using to infinity. Of course, this is impossible impossible to compute in general. Actually, it is proved that this goes to infinity precisely at the zero error capacity. So even computing the zero error capacity is an unsolved problem. You can imagine that computing this curve here is impossible in general. And okay, since those are lower bounds on the error exponent, it means that you can encode with probability of error to equal to zero on the left. So of course, those are lower bounds on the zero error capacity. This is an upper bound on the zero error capacity. But the good point is that the lower bound, when you send the block to infinity, the block, I mean, that you use to compute the expurgated bound. Actually, the lower bound achieved the true zero error capacity. The problem is that it is usually impossible to compute this curve here. Okay. Any questions here? I don't know if I'm going very slowly on this or too fast, maybe. Just to add one comment, those quantities are not necessarily discrete. Actually, we will see some examples where they are all the same value. And in this talk, what I want to show is what we got when we started to study the problem of trying to improve the bounds that we have for typewriter channels, which are channels like this. You have some input, you have transition probability in this structure here. We are considering only symmetric typewriter channels, so all the transition probabilities from one symbol to the next one are equal to epsilon, and the last one goes back to the first one with the probability equal to epsilon two. So the, m the minimum number of inputs that you need to get something useful 
in terms of zero error capacity is four. If you have only three symbols, the zero error capacity is zero. So we start from four inputs and go on and see what happens. So why did we choose such strange or say such a model? It is the simplest non-trivial case for which the zero error capacity is larger than zero. Actually, this channel here is the channel that Shannon used in his paper on the zero error capacity, which essentially caused the whole theory of uh, LOVAS on uh, semi-definite programming and so forth. So this is a very simple example, but it, it was very, very useful in research because it, it was an important problem in the history of information theory and I would say combinatorics, graph theory and so on. Okay, so just what are the classic, the classic known results on typewriter channels? If you take, as I said, three inputs, then the zero error capacity is zero. Any input can be confused with any other input. So the zero error capacity here is zero. The sphere packing bound still goes to infinity at a positive rate, which is not very nice. And this is just to show that the sphere packing bound at low rates can be very weak. So here, it doesn't even realize that the zero error capacity is zero. The expurgated bound is something like this. And then there is this straight line bound that we saw before. So let's go move to the first case where you have a zero error capacity with four inputs. The sphere packing bound is this one. Here you have the random coding lower bound. And this is the, the expurgated bound. And as you see already, the expurgated bound computed for k equal to one, if you remember in this picture, you could compute the expurgated bound for different block lengths. So even computed for k equal to one, it gives you already the same result as the sphere packing bound in terms of bounding the zero error capacity. So you already find that the zero error capacity is equal to one immediately for this channel. We will see later on why this is actually almost obvious. Let me point out that this part here is actually curved only if you take epsilon small enough. Otherwise, here you would just have a straight line here and a straight line here. Then, when you move to five inputs, you get something interesting. And you see the upper bound on the error exponent given by the sphere packing bound is this one. So it goes to infinity at log of five divided by two. So the zero error capacity must be on the left of this line here. When you compute the expurgated bound for k equal to one, you get this one, and we will see later why this is the case. For k equal to two, you get the log square root five. And so we know that the zero error capacity is in this range here. This was known at the time of Shannon published this paper. And Lovas actually proved that the true value is this one. So this is actually weak as an upper bound on the zero error capacity. Now, let me just use this picture to explain why we were interested in this problem. Now the best, or say the most general upper bound on the reliability function that is known in the literature is the sphere packing bound. There is this straight line bound that we saw before, this one, but this only works when the zero error capacity is equal to zero. There is no such an extension, or it is not that, uh, of, uh, say, useful when the zero error capacity is positive. And so, in a sense, there is something here which is not very good because we know that in this range here, it is not possible to encode that probability, equal, probability of error equal to zero. So there must be some probability of error which is positive, but there is no bound in the literature which is, say, good in this region here. So the idea was, can we find upper bound on the reliability function in this region here? Okay, so let me try to give you an idea of what happens when you try to study the zero error capacity first and then see the error exponent. So why is the zero error capacity of this channel here equal to one? This is not so difficult to see. You can use two inputs that are not confusable. You see this in the channel like this, and in the graph, if you want, you can consider those inputs like those. So there is a trivial rate one zero error code. You just use those two inputs. You send one bit per channel use, and there, there is no hope that the decoder can be confused by the channel. So the zero error capacity is at least one, and each input sequence, if you pick any input sequence, this is compatible with two to the n output sequences. So by just counting how many input sequences you can pack, you will realize that once you exceed uh, four to the n divided by two to the n input sequences, at least two of them will collide at the output. So the zero error capacity cannot be larger than one to the n, one over n log of this quantity, which is just one. So by simply computing a sort of sphere packing in terms of number of code words that are compatible with input sequences. Sorry, number of output sequences that are compatible with input code. So here the zero error capacity is equal to one, very simple. Now, let me try to see how the expurgated bound works for this. And 
I just don't want to go into the explicated bound now, maybe later on if we have more, if I realize that I have time, but the, the key idea of the explicated bound is this. You fix k, which is the same parameter that I shown before on how you want to compute the explicated bound, and fin fix a distribution on sequences of length k. Then you want to build a random code, and the way you build a random code is that you build for n multiple of k a random code word as simply a sequence of n over k IID blocks. So take k equal to one, for example, if it's just a distribution on the input, you build a random code word, that's it. Then you build a code slightly larger than what you would like to have, actually twice as much, as many code words as you need. And you throw away the worst m code words from each code, and you can prove that there must be some realization where after expurgating the worst m code words, you get something which is very good. So see, this is the idea. This is the expression that comes out. I don't want to go too much into this expression now, maybe later on if I have time. But you get uh, some expression of lower bounds in the reliability function in this form here. You see k is showing up here to see that, to, to mean that you can choose k. And it goes down somehow to the fact that uh, you are computing uh, this quadratic form here. Maybe I'll get back to this point later. There was a conjecture in Shannon Gallagher Berlecan paper in 1967. This is the famous paper where they gave the rigorous proof of the sphere packing bound, the straight line bound, the zero, uh, the zero rate bound, and so forth. And at some point they conjectured that maybe when you compute the expurgated bound for k that goes to infinity, since remember the zero error capacity is actually approached by the expurgated bound, so maybe actually that is the true reliability function. So they said, is it maybe the case that when you send k to infinity, this expurgated lower bound is actually the reliability function? And this was disproved by Katzmann, Fassmann, and Vladut in, actually it took quite a, a long time, 23 years to, this is not rigorously 1990, I don't know exactly, the paper is 1992, but essentially they had the result already four years before or something. So around 90, 1990, they disproved this conjecture using algebraic ge geometric codes. And in particular, the scheme worked for symmetric QR channels with at least 49 inputs. So it is not something that you can really get into without spending a, a bit of time understanding the theory. It's not that easy. So the first contribution, I think, in this publication that we are, that we are having is that we provide a very simple example of a disproof of this conjecture here by just using a typewriter channel with four inputs. So here is the idea. You, you know that there is a zero error code for the four input typewriter channel, which is this one that we mentioned before. You just use input, input symbol zero or two. Now assume, in, let me plot in time here the possible symbols that you can use. So it means that you are only using the red circles here. And a code word is just a choice of a path over those red circles. So all paths on the red circle is a possible code word. Now, instead of taking only this zero error code, we take also some possible cosets of this zero error code. Because you see, whether you use zero or two here, or you use one or three, it doesn't really change, right? You still have a zero error code. And in particular, in any coordinate, you can decide to use zero and two or one and three. So one possible coset for this code here is this one, where in the second coordinate you use one and three, in this coordinate, you use one and three, and so forth. And if you find, if you check this code here, is actually the coset of this one when you add this code word here. So now, since you only have to distinguish even input, even indexed inputs from old indexed inputs, a coset can be just described by a binary word. So there is a one-to-one -one map between a coset of the original zero error code and the binary code and the binary sequence. Sorry. So what we do is we build a code which is simply the zero error code plus where this here is the set sum. So you compute all the possible combinations of elements from here and here. And we add a binary code which is a good one for, for binary humming matrix. So where those sequences that we use for the cosets are very different. So in a sense we build many cosets like this but we make sure that the cosets are really different uh, in a good way. And so what happens is that if you pick a good binary code and you compute the probability of error for the, for the code that we get like this, it is very simple to compute it, or say not too difficult to compute it, and you get 
a bound which is nicely the shifted version of the expurgated bound for the binary symmetric channel, shift to the right because of course we have two, uh, two four inputs here. And when you plot the bound, you see that actually it is better than the expurgated bound and much, quite much better I would say. So this is the standard expurgated bound and this is the bound that we get. Now this standard expurgated bound one my ask whether it is compute for k equal to one or k equal to two or k equal to infinity. Actually, we sat down to compute the expurgated bound and we found that it is not even difficult or very much difficult to prove that this expurgated bound when the number of inputs to the channel is even does not change whether you take k equal to one, k equal to two or k equal to three and so forth. So essentially it is always the same. So you can actually explicitly compute the expurgated bound for k that goes to infinity for those channels for those typewriter channels when the number of inputs is even. So what I say here will work whether the, the, there are four, six, eight inputs, it doesn't really change. You always get the same technique. And actually you get that all the bounds are the same as the, same, the bounds that you have for the binary symmetry channel just shift on the right. So you can prove that the expurgated bound is just the shifted version of the one, uh, sorry, no, actually the expurgated bound here the first time it shows up is at q equal to four. And then when you take q equal to six, eight, and so forth, it is always the same. This is a shifted version of the binary, exp the expurgated bound for the binary symmetry channel. The sphere packing bound also is a shifted version of the one for the binary symmetry channel and so forth. So in particular, one nice thing is that, that I would like to point out is that for the binary symmetry channel, the sphere packing bound approaches a value which is twice as much the one achieved by the expurgated bound. So since we are just using shifted version of the plot, our new bound here, the red one, which improves essentially from here to here. And this value is half of the value for the sphere packing bound. Now, if you remember in the very first plot that I used, there was a straight line bound. So for the binary symmetric channel, there is a situation like this. Here you have, oh, I don't think I need it, okay. It is a sphere packing bound. Here you have the expurgated bound. And this is half of this. And then there was this straight line bound here, sorry. So it was proved that the expurgated bound is tight, so there was this straight line bound here. Now, one interesting thing that you might want to, to know is that we were not able to find a straight line bound in this case. So still, we have a gap in this case. Even though it is everything, sh everything is shipped, there is a, uh, an explicit reason why we are not able to do that. So when you say this sphere has two binary aspects, you only see them both as two square expurgated bound. Yeah, essentially you take the Gilbert Vasham of, uh, so yeah. what is important for us is that the spectrum of the code is uh, binomial. So yeah, essentially to compute the probability of error, we do a union bound over all neighbors. And so we need the spectrum of the code more or less. These are all, all linear codes, so, so this is a linear code, so we take C2 to be linear, in such a way that the sum of this plus this is still linear in this, uh, for the quaternary channel, and we use gilbert varsham bound for linear codes. Actually, it's gilbert varsham for uh, the spectrum, I mean, so for the binomial distribution of the spectrum. Okay, so here one comment, which I think is very important. So, First of all, I would say that what I was very surprised when we, because we didn't believe right that we had improved the expurgated bound because it was too simple the way we were improving the expurgated bound. So we came to the conclusion that actually nobody really took the trouble to plot the expurgated bound at that time because the scheme that we are using is not really strange. Other people surely, actually probably when I was talking to uh, Rami, that means, and we mentioned what kind of scheme we were using. He said, isn't that already used in the expurgated bound? That is so trivial, of course it must be already there, but actually it isn't. So probably nobody really computed the expurgated bound uh, for this channel explicitly before. And so what happens is that we are using a zero error code to build the cosette. But if you think about, it, we use a zero error code for a rate which is larger than the zero error capacity. So when there, you know already that there will be positive probability of error, so the zero error code is not that strange. I mean, also the expurgated bound is able to, to spot that zero error code, but you need to push the rate at lower values. So when you get to rate lower than the zero error capacity, actually the expurgated bound shows you that there is a zero error code. 
Now the question I think important is, can one modify in general the expurgated bound to exploit very low rate codes even at higher rates? Because in this case, if you take the expurgated bound for this range, you find a zero error code and you see that actually you could use that rate, that code also at higher rates. So in general, I think one should ask this question. And the answer, I don't know, so I, I hope someone will try to do this because I think it's important. I have no idea. We tried somehow to use this in other contexts, it didn't work too much. Okay, so zero case of five input. So when the number of inputs is even, what we have said goes through. So the case of interest now is when the number of inputs is odd. Now for seven inputs and so forth, we don't even know the zero capacity, so doing something is essentially <coughs> very difficult. So let's see what happens when you take five inputs. So the typewriter tunnel is this one, the confusability graph is this pentagon here. I want to consider first the zero error capacity, so let me try to just focus on the confusability graph for a moment. So when you take the confusability graph, you see the independence number of this graph here is two. There are two symbols which are not confusable. You can find three symbols that are not confusable, of course. So at least you can send one bit per channel use. But what Shannon, Shannon noticed in, 56, in his 56 paper is that actually the zero error capacity of this channel here is larger than one because when you use the channel twice, and let me represent two uses of the channel as a graph like this. So this is the first input, this is the second input. If in two uses of the channel you use this red constellation here, then this is a zero error code. There is no way of confusing those code words in the channel when used twice. So there are five code words of length two which cannot be confused with one another. So the independence number of G squared is five. So the zero error capacity is at least one half log of five. So log of square root five if you want. So larger than one. So, uh, okay, Shannon had this lower bound. The upper bound was the one derived essentially by sphere packing. So it was log of five over two. And okay, so this is the one that I was saying. So if you again compute how many sequences at the output are compatible with any input sequence, you find there are two to the n. So again, you do the same sphere packing that we did before and the capacity of the graph is at most log of five over two. And it took 20 or so years to prove that actually the lower bound is right. So this is actually the lower bound for the zero capacity. Maybe I can try to, no, maybe I, I will skip an explanation of the way Lovas proved this. Maybe later I'll try to get back to this. At what time should I stop? 20, right? Oh, 15, okay, maybe I could do it. Okay, let me leave this on hold. If I have time, I'll get back to this. So let me first, try to explain what the achievability is, what our achievability result is for this case. In this case, uh, you see the zero error code is built on two uses of the channel. So it is reasonable that you should use this structure here. So what we do is take a code of even length. So now I'm listing the time instance there. Time equal to one and two is this constellation here. So this is the first use of the channel. This is the second one. This is the third one, fourth one, so forth. So the red circles say what the inputs are that are used in Shannon code. So Shannon code is any sequence of red circles. Okay, so you take all possible sequences and you get the code. So again, we want to use this idea that we had before of using cosets of this. It is first of all, very nice and lucky that this code here is linear. In each constellation, it is linear. So in the end, the whole Shannon code is linear. And so you can actually take cosets more or less as you would do with the previous case. And let me show you what happens. When you take this constellation, you can just use it as it is, or you can move the constellation down by one sample. So this goes here, this which is here goes here. This one goes back to the previous symbol here. So the first symbol here. So you can move the constellation down twice or three or four times. And so you have essentially for this constellation here, five different cosets, this, 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 and this. So this implies that now a coset for the whole code is any combination of cosets for the constellation and the code words are just all sequences that goes that go through the colored circles. 
And so you see now you have five cosets per two coordinates. And so this implies that there is a one-to-one -one map between a coset of the whole code and a word in F5 raised to N over two, where N was the original number of tunnel uses of the channel. You divide by two because you need two coordinates to build one different coset. And so in this case, you now find a map between coset and word in half of the length of the code in F5. So a choice of good coset is just a choice of a good code in this space here. So what we do is we apply essentially the same idea as before. We take the zero error code plus a good code in this space and we get this curve here, the red one, which improves again the, zero, the, the expurgated bound. Now during the computation, in this case, this union bound that we were mentioning before is not as trivial because you have to pay attention of how, say, the humming weight of code words in this space will impact the distance of coset in this space here. So there is a tricky computation to do, actually a bit uh, tedious, but it works. And we get this lower bound, the red one, which improves the expurgated bound. Now here, what I'm afraid I will not have time to do is to explain why we can actually ensure that this red curve here is not the expurgated bound only for k equal to one. It is the expurgated bound that you get if you send k to infinity. We are not able to it is, sorry, it is not for k equal to one or k equal to two first. And if you send k to infinity, you will not improve this curve here. We are not able to say what happens for odd values of k. So it might be that for odd values of k, you get something uh, different. But when you send k to infinity, you don't get more than this. So this is for sure the best that you can have. So there is a strange property of the expurgated bound for which the expurgated bound is, say, subadditive. So uh, there is a subadditivity property. For, so if you compute the expurgated bound, say, for k equal to eight, it will, of course, be uh, it will always be better than for k equal to four. But it is not sure that it is better than for k equal to seven. So you can, if you can split the block length in smaller sub-blocks, then you will be uh, always beating <laughs> what you get in the sub-blocks. But if you just decrease by one, so from eight to seven, maybe it's better at seven. But since we can push k to infinity only using the even numbers, we know that asymptotically you cannot beat this. And so we are improving the asymptotic expurgated one. Okay, so here there is a, so this plot here is a, about lower bounds and also upper bounds that you get. So let me try to explain what we did for the upper bound, which is, by the way, the most difficult part. So everything I explained now, up to now, for me, it's very interesting because it means that people did not pay too much attention in the past. But uh, to this specific case, I mean, of course, they worked very hard on the general case. Now, I would like to explain the upper bounds. And so let me try to explain you what you see here in this picture, first of all. So this uh, black dashed curve is the sphere packing bound. It goes to infinity at this point here, which is log of five over two. Yeah, there are many. So this black here that goes up there, the black one, is the sphere packing bound. This blue curve here is a new upper bound that we have now which is anyway not very difficult to get. I mean, really simple to find. This is a straight line bound built on top of this one that we have. But the most interesting one is this black here one. Because black dot, black dot yes. Because this is a finite upper bound on the exponent at the left of the sphere packing bound. So this is something actually that oh, there was not a theory ready yet to be plot. And here you just see the straight line bound built from this connecting to the sphere packing bound, which is the left one. So let me just try to explain what we did to, to get this upper bound. And uh, there are many details that I cannot explain, but I will try at least to give you the idea. So first of all, why, why is, not, is the sphere packing bound not working in this region here? There is somehow a good reason, which is uh, quite well understood, I think. The sphere packing bound, says that C0 is less than log of five over two, so this quantity here. On the left, it doesn't say anything. And this relies on the fact that when you use sphere packing, you are trying essentially to distinguish the true code word from the bulk of the other code words. So, so from the average code or the random message and so forth. So you try to take one message out of the, the whole 
set of all the messages. At low rate, at low rate, this is loose because it is known that at some point there will be just two messages that are so similar that it is useless to try to compare one message with the remaining set of messages. You just should compare with the closest neighbor, say. And so it is known that pairwise comparison uh, give better results at low, low rates. So since we know that the zero capacity is actually smaller than the log of square root five, in this range here, there must be two cons confusable messages. So let's try to find out what messages are confusable and are also very similar. So they must be easily confusable. Sorry? No, confusable means that there is a probability of actually not being able to distinguish them. But of course, depending on how many different inputs they are using, they will be more or less confusable. So if, say, if you take a, uh, sorry, in this, in this graph here, assume you take uh, two messages, they use those two symbols all the time, and then at some point in the very last sample, they use the same input symbol. Oh, sorry, no, I, did, I said something stupid. Sorry, you use two messages that use those two inputs, but depending on how frequently they take the same value and how frequently they take different values, of course it will be easier or more difficult to distinguish them as before. So essentially, once they are confusable, okay, this is a good uh, point to, to say something. Once they are confusable, it is the humming distance that tells you how much they are confusable. But you have to first say that they are confusable. So for rates larger than the log of square root five, one can ask, uh, what are the two most confusable messages? So how much confusable must be those code words that are confusable? And in the typewriter tunnel, as I was saying, two code words, once they are confusable, they are comp confusable to an extent which depends on the humming distance, how frequently they take different values at the input. So the probability of error can be upper bound, lower bounded by epsilon, which is the transition probability, raised to the minus d, where d is the humming distance. But you need to know that those two messages are confusable, otherwise this will not work. Okay, I don't have much time. So one way to just use this expression even for non-confusable messages is to say, when two messages are not confusable, let me put this distance here to infinity. So this goes to zero, and I would say the probability of error is larger than or equal to zero. This is not, this is trivial. So let's define a metric for this channel, which says, okay, if the two symbols are confusable, then the distance is one if they are different, but if they are not confusable, the distance is infinite. So we build a, a semi-metric like this, so symbols that are confusable and different are at distance one. Symbols that are not confusable are at infinite distance. And then we essentially need to, st to study the minimum distance of the code under this metric here. Okay. So the problem boils down to find the minimum distance of a code built on a graph like this, where the distance has this structure here. So the probability of error will be larger than or equal to epsilon to the minus minimum distance of the code. And so we study this the highest rate that you can achieve in such a way that the minimum distance of the code asymptotically is at least delta n, where delta is the parameter that you want to study. And here it is interesting because using this uh, framework here, you are essentially considering two cases, which is one, if you take a graph which has all, which is fully connected, so the complete graph, so there is no infinite distance. All different symbols are at distance one. So the distance here is just the humming distance. So once you compute this, you're just computing the rate, distance trade off in humming space. But if you now take something like this and you ask for delta to be larger than one. So of course, when two symbols are different, the distance is either one or infinity. If you want the minimum distance of the code to be larger than one, it means that this distance, non-normalized distance is larger than n, so the only way you can have it is that the distance is infinite. So there must be at least one point where the symbols are at infinite distance. So in this framework, we have both the graph capacity and the rate distance trade-off of codes in humming space in the same definition. And so if you manage to do this, somehow you have to take care of bounds on the minimum distance in humming space and graph capacity. And what we did is actually try to mix the two things. I have no time to go through the theory, I'm sorry. I thought I could at least explain this. 
And here there is a nice trick for those of you which have worked with linear programming bound. There is a Fourier transform, uh, Fourier uh, theoretic uh, explanation of the linear programming bound. So we use a similar explanation and try to find out a connection between, between a choice of a function in the space. Okay, since I have no hope to do this on the slide, let me try to give you just the idea. Because the idea is very simple, then the math is not very simple. But when you compute, for example, the, say the plot came bound for the minimum distance of a code, what you do is to say, okay, the minimum distance of the code must be small, larger than or equal, sorry? Uh, sorry, smaller than the average of the pairwise compared pairwise distances. So you take the distance between this and this, this and this, take the average, and the minimum must be smaller than the average. So it cannot be too large. Now, instead of summing the distances, you can say, okay, let me put a weight function here. Actually, this idea, I think, goes back to Weiner in the 60s or something. Let me put a, a function here, and instead of computing the average value of the distances, I compute the average values of the function weight from one point to the other. If you can find, again, it will be the case that the average function weight will be larger than or equal to the minimum function weight. So the point is that you can find very smart functions that essentially go to zero or become negative if, say this is one code word, this is another code word. If you want to ensure that the code minimum distance cannot be too large, you can find a, a function which goes below zero at the minimum distance that you want to study. And so essentially when you compute the pairwise weight of the function on a, a code with a guarantee on the minimum distance, you will always pick negative values for the pairwise comparison. And so essentially you are computing the number of code words because you take the value of the function at the center plus something negative for all pairs. So you are counting how many code words do you have plus something negative. So this is smaller than or equal to the number of code words. And you, you can do some tricks, you move to the Fourier domain. But anyway, the basic idea is that instead of taking the plot came bound with the distances, you put some weight function, and then you start this. And okay, the, the theory here is too long, I don't have the time to explain, but when you do the math, it turns out that one particular choice of this fu that function that I showed there, one particular choice gives you the lowest theta function, another particular choice gives you the so-called JPL or MRRW minimum distance, bounds on the minimum distance in dynamic spaces. And what we are doing is take essentially the product of those two functions. So this G here is the choice that you can use there to get the lowest theta function. This H is the choice that the MRRW uses to find the best known bound on minimum distance in humming spaces. We take the product of the two and we build this H in a tricky way in such a way that in the Fourier domain there are some properties that you need to make the computation simple, otherwise it is too difficult. And essentially we manage to bound the size of the code by the product of two terms. This is lowest bound, and this is the MRRW bound. But the nice part is that when you split the expression in these two forms, what you get in the MRRW bound is essentially something which is in terms of a, a imaginary alphabet, say, uh, virtual alphabet, which has size square root of five. And the reason for this square root of five is that, as you have seen before, there are five cosets per two coordinates. So actually the alphabet is five, but you need to split it in two coordinates. So it turns out that the mathematics actually represent this in a strange way, and it turns out that you have to use the MRRW expressions, but for an alphabet of cardinality square root of five, which is something strange. But the math works, so that's not easier. So let me just go to the. So isn't there a more useful definition of this? Because if you put it as one is the largest fragment of a code, what that can get rid of this square. Yeah. So it's not that much more than a square. Yeah, actually, the, the, the way we did it was through association schemes. I was writing through association schemes that Yuri complained that it was <laughs> too complicated and let's do it in a Fourier transform. Uh, so if you write this, we did it with association schemes. So we actually used that approach. But the association scheme for this kind of channel, you can 
simplify it a lot because it is completely symmetric. So you can just use Fourier domain. Essentially, when you build the association scheme, the diagonalizing matrices are just Fourier transform. So the eigenvalues are just the Fourier transform of the values you put in the rows and you get back the Fourier transform. But, but you are perfectly right, this is the association scheme. So the only tricky part, if you already know everything of association scheme, the tricky part is to see that you can build an F which is a product of two functions and that you can choose this H in such a way that you manage to compute the bound because otherwise it's very difficult because so you're probably familiar with these expressions here. So are you familiar with this formulation? So when you have to take the Fourier transform of F, if this F is a product of two, that would be a convolution. So computing the convolution in zero would be a nightmare if you don't choose properly this G and this H. So we exploit the form of the G taken by the log of theta function, and we take an H in such a way that when you compute the convolution, it's very easy. And in zero, at least, it is very easy to compute because where there is, where the value for the Fourier transform of G is not zero, the value of the Fourier transform for H is zero, so they will all cancel and you can compute it. It might be that different choices of H give something better, but it would be a nightmare to compute. I don't <laughs> want to. Sorry, I'm out of time. So the plot was that one that we showed already. That is the black one. Then you compute the straight line bound. That actually there is some other part of the work which I didn't mention, but this is the one we just discussed. If you take the particular case epsilon equal to one half, you get further symmetry in the channel. You can use an, uh, an advanced simulation of this linear programming bound, which originate, originated in a paper by Kalai and Lineal, and you can improve this to a better bound even using this. But here you need not compute only the minimum distance of the code, you need to compute also how many neighbors you have at least around the culture. Sorry, I'm 